welcome. It's Mark with Kicks. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Man, we're doing so good to have you guys back. It's 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 Hollywood. It's the whiskey a go go. If like I just said, these walls could talk. Yeah. You know what I mean? Zeppelin, who, Jimi Hendrix. I mean, and Aerosmith was here over the summer. Oh, I yeah. understand. Van Halen, yeah. Motley Crue. Sure. I mean, it, it doesn't get any better than that. But. Who were some of the bands growing up that really got you excited about wanting to play music? Uh, you know, you just ran through my list. I mean, I was, uh, you know, certainly when I was when I was young. I mean, I've always been a huge Rush fan, so they're, you know, my all time favorite. And Led Zeppelin and and uh, the Who, and um, you know, l uh, later on when I started playing music, of course, I got into you know Motley Crue and some of the heavier, you know, Metallica, of course. And uh, you know, I've always been into a little bit heavier music. Yeah. And um, so, like with like Soundgarden, I love Soundgarden. It's one of my favorite bands. Um, new bands, Bullet for My Valentine is one of my favorites. Or I've seen them five or six times. They're amazing. Yeah. Uh, just good heavy stuff, you know. So, but my roots are definitely based in uh, you know Rush and Led Zeppelin and and the Who and and yeah. all that early stuff that was you know when rock really started to get big, you know. Yeah, you know, it was like before MTV, and it, it just seemed like. Yes. Music was more pure. You know, the bands could do their own thing. They weren't worried about what do we look like. Like, right. what, what's no the videos. Right. What, what, what brand are we promoting? You know? Right. It just seemed like everybody was an island upon themselves. It was like Zeppelin was in a whole other world. Yeah. Than, Speaking of gimmicks, I can't leave Kiss out. Oh, you know? yeah. <laughs> they were one of my favorites since I was in sixth grade. Yeah. So. I mean, the, the comic book came to life, the horror yep. movie, everything yep. right there. You know, Kiss has played here too. I yeah. Mean, it's, it's amazing stuff. So, Tell, tell us about that evolution into getting to like starting to write your own music and say, hey man, I think I got some potential here, and we need to like man, that's be original. A, yeah, that's a long uh, that was a long process for me. I mean, I I I, I started uh, I got in a band with a guy that I write songs with by the name of Rob Galpin, who co-wrote a bunch of songs on our latest record, Rocky Face Off, mm -hmm. and he's written songs with Steve and I in another band we were in called Funny Money, mm -hmm. and um, so I got in a band with him many many years ago. And we had, um, uh, you know, real crappy four-track recorders, and and you know, our goal was always to, you know, God, why can't our records sound like Led Zeppelin records or Van Halen records? You know, so we were always, you know, striving to make our songs better and to make our our recordings better. You know, so we could just ride around in our car and listen to it, you know, top volume. We didn't have any much more designs than that, other than you know, getting to be better songwriters and better better recorders. So. Um, but yeah, and then we started, you know, we liked our songs enough that we started putting them in our in our sets and, and um, you know, we would play, uh, you know, a whole set of originals and two sets of covers. So that was pretty much how the bar bands went back back in those days. You play three one hour sets and we were we were able to sneak a, a whole set's worth of originals in there. So so that's where it kind of that's how it kind of evolved for me. And then I started getting, you know, much more serious about songwriting and and you know, getting into analyzing uh, songs of my favorite writers, you know, Paul McCartney yeah. and, and, you know, f figuring out the mechanics of being a songsmith. And so, so that's kind of where, that's kind of how it evolved for me. You know, first wanting to, you know, be like your heroes, you know, make your songs sound like The Who and Van Halen and whatnot. And then, you know, getting, digging a little bit deeper and going, you know, hey, these songs are actually fun to play and they're catchy, you know. So, so that's how it worked out for me, you know, and working with, with Rob and having somebody to work with all the time that was as passionate about songwriting as I was and still am is always a big help. You know, it's harder to work in a bubble, you know, when you have somebody to bounce ideas off of. Yeah. Generally speaking, it ends up as a much better product. Yeah, you get some critique, yeah. kind of, you know, yeah. hammered in shape. Or you have the same vision where, you know, your goal is to, you know, make your stuff sound like X, whatever it is that day that is your muse, you know. So, um, so that, that's pretty much how it went for me. That's great stuff. Now tell us how you came to, you know, meet Steve and how that evolution started in Funny Money and now continues in Kicks. Well, the, uh, Steve had had uh, Funny Money for quite some time and, and his uh, old bass player, Ned Maloney, had um, recommended me. And back in the old days, like when um, Midnight Dynamite came out, I was actually good friends with Ronnie in Kicks, Ronnie 1010. And so we were, uh, we would go to concerts together. We went and actually saw Guns N' Roses and Hammerjacks together. So I was kind of Ronnie's concert buddy back then, to, to say the least. And um, so we had done a bunch of warm up gigs for Kicks where we would just play all originals. Mm -hmm. And so Steve remembered me from those days. And so um, Steve's old bass player recommended me. And I was like, hey, that might, might be fun. You know, so I called Steve up and he was like, hey, you know, I, I remember you. You know, you don't really have to 
come up and audition. You can have the gig if you want, you know. And I was like, oh, okay, well, that's easy, you know. So got in the band, and we did, you know, Steve and I did a couple records with Funny Money together, and, um, uh, and, and you know, we've always had worked well together and, I, you know, got to know each other. And then we got Jimmy and Funny Money, and, and uh, so it was just something for us to do for a while there until kicks started to take off and something for us to do in between kicks gigs and and it was you know so we see each other every week and hang out and stuff and play music it, it doesn't really get much better than that for for us you know yeah you know and you guys have been work, working on your songs i know you know everybody contributed to funny money and now this new album and steve who we talked to earlier gives you a lot of credit for being in there and you know working frontiers and you know, working Tom and, and you got loud and proud and, mm -hmm. and all that. What, what was it about the business side that you realized like, man, unless, unless you really, get, you know, start to learn the business, you're just kind of a dumb musician. You know, you really got to kind yes. of handle your business or yes. something might handle it for you. Well, it's called the music business for a reason, as we all know, right? I'm sure that's been said before. I'm sure Gene yes. Simmons invented that, yes, right? So. So I think back in, uh, uh, you know, Tom Lipsky, who's the president and CEO of uh, Loud and Proud, he was with Roadrunner. And before that, he had a, um, uh, a co management booking company, record company called CMC Management uh, and CMC Records out of North Carolina. Yeah. And Rob, who I spoke of earlier, him and I were actually signed to his management company, and they were trying to get us a record deal. And this was around 1990, 1991. And so... So we had a lot of business meetings with, with Tom, and it didn't, didn't work out. We, could, we didn't get signed. We had a bunch of offers, and, and it just didn't work out. But we stayed, uh, you know, Tom and I stayed in touch over many, many years. And uh, uh, Tom actually had done Kix's last album, uh, Show Business. So there's a lot of commonality in there. But I learned a lot about the, the business end of it from sort of being the contact person in that particular band when we were signed with CMC with Tom Litsky back then. And so... You know, Tom's a brilliant guy. He knows everybody, and he knows, um, you know, he's always very calm and very, you know, and has a vision. You know, and I learned a lot of things from Tom just from paying attention to what, you know, Tom was doing and what he was talking about and what he was having us do and in terms of trying to get, the band was called Centerfold at the time that Rob and I were in, in terms of trying to get us signed. And so, you know, I really paid attention to that quite a bit, and then, um, you know, working at, through different businesses after that had had different successful businesses and watching other businessmen work, you know, those lessons you can apply to almost any business. So um, so those kind of things kind of, they added up for me and, and, you know, I used those lessons that I learned in everything that we do and I try to apply those to what we do with kicks, you know, and try to have, you know, some kind of... Um, uh, some kind of path and like looking beyond the next week and and you know hopefully the guys uh, yeah hopefully you know hopefully everybody's you know seem like we're all on the same page we 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 do do pretty well so um, but that's you know those were hard lessons to learn you know when you're a young musician and you just think you want to play and and meet girls you know but um, in the long run if you want to really have success I mean you got to pay attention to to the other end of it and sometimes it's uncomfortable and it's probably some of the least creative stuff that you'll do as a musician mm -hmm. and but it, in the end it helps you with your art you know if you're paying attention to your business and the more people get to hear your songs and that's really the goal for every songwriter is you want more people to hear your songs and and hopefully they enjoy it and connect to it and then yeah. they come to your shows and buy your t-shirts <laughs> well a lot of musicians don't want to hear it but I always say it's 10% music and 90% business because this, some of the most talented people in the world are sitting in their basements right now. And it's so true. Are. I mean, if you think about just the, the, you know, the path that it takes to do a simple gig to, for us to fly out to L.A. You know, we had you know, logistics a couple months ago. We're buying plane tickets. Who's going? You know, is our sound man going to be able to get off of work? Um, you know, which airline are we going to take? And, you know, what backline gear and all that forward stuff. I mean, that's all business stuff. You know, it's something that, that you really have to keep on top of. Otherwise, you show up somewhere and things are less than ideal. And when things are less than ideal, it makes the gig suck. And you, you sort of keep paying attention and you learn your lessons and then you know that you have to keep on top of that stuff. It has absolutely nothing to do with being creative or writing a song or performing a song. Yeah. But it's just as essential to get to that point, to get to those two hours where you get to, you're, you have the privilege of entertaining the people that are paying to come and see you. Yeah. You have to do all that prep work to make sure that you look professional, you sound professional, 
and you can make the songs sound the way that the fans expect them to sound. So, yeah. um, so it's a, you know, just in that microcosm of the whole broad statement of the music business, just you know, doing one show, there's a ton of business behind just getting there. So. Yeah. Plus, you want to know that if your business is handled, you can rock out and know that everybody's going to get their fair share, everything's handled. Sure. You know, Absolutely. You know that, that worrying feeling like uh, we're just players. Sure. Yeah. Ab absolutely. And that you know, and, and that held true to uh, you know doing this last record that we just did. I mean, it was. Talk talk about that. What what do you feel you know most proud of accomplishing, and what was kind of the evolution of coming up with the songs? Because I know probably some of the songs were written possibly around Funny Money Time and. How did it lead into? Yeah, this not album, not too many. Out? Some of those, most of those songs were were. I think there's maybe one or two that might have been, um, you know, w w me as a songwriter, I don't write for any particular thing. Yeah. I just write the songs, so the song. and then, you know, maybe it fits this band or fits that band or it fits no band. You know, all my yeah. country songs will never get heard. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> so, so I think there was a couple of songs that were hanging around and could have been on a Funny Money record, but most of the stuff came, um, you know, after we had decided to do. Uh, to do the Kicks record, so it's it's fairly fresh, and um, uh, you, you know they they're once we decided to do it, you know we had like 30 songs to go through, and I think Brian and I sat down first and and sort of weeded through the ones that, you know Brian was kind of the gatekeeper on trying to make sure that whatever we were thinking about picking was most Kicks like, you know what rather than just pick it ourselves. You know, as everybody probably knows by now, we got Taylor Rhodes involved, who wrote uh, "Crying" for Aerosmith. He wrote for Loverboy. I mean, he and he wrote probably about 12 or 13 Kicks songs from back in the day, or Taylor Rhodes songs. Mm -hmm. So Taylor's very in touch with what is Kicks and what isn't Kicks. So when the process of selecting songs came up and we got Taylor involved, we all bought into the to the process of saying Taylor's the man. He's going to pick. He knows, and so Taylor pretty much picked all the songs. There were a few songs that we knew were slam dunk that we knew were going to be kick songs, like uh, Top Down. It was it was like, oh yeah, well that's absolutely a kick song. Rock Your Face Off was a song that Brian brought in, and we knew that that one was a kick song. But some of the other ones, we were like, you know, there's some songs that didn't make it on the record that we felt were kick songs that Taylor did not think they were. And so we were like, okay, sounds good, let's do it. You know, let's record. Mm -hmm. So Taylor was very instrumental in. And, and uh, along with Brian being the, the Kicks gatekeeper kind of guy, yeah. in funneling those songs into the sound and the and the, the energy that the fans expect from a Kicks record. So, so you, you know I feel I feel great about those songs. I mean they're they're you know every time I listen to the record and you know we just did a, a music video for Wheels and mm -hmm. you know for me because I was a Kicks fan before I got in Kicks. Mm -hmm. So for me to see those guys that I play in a band with and to hear them on a record performing new material as a Kicks fan it's like oh these you know I love these guys they're so great Steve is so great Jimmy's a monster Ronnie and Brian with the dual guitar attack it's just for me as a Kicks fan it's it's terrific to hear it and I'm sure other fans can relate to that feeling but then being in the band it's like wow this is great I get to actually participate too but but for me you know the the really you know, looking back on everything that we did with making the record and getting a record with record deal with Tom Lipsky and Loud and Proud, mm -hmm. you, you know, the the satisfaction of hearing some of my favorite musicians in the whole world since I was very young in the music scene are these four other guys, and to hear them on a new record performing music that's really pretty god darn good mm -hmm. is is very satisfying for me, and it's just wonderful to be a part of it. It's fantastic. I know you guys are going to be headlining, you know, M3, you've got the Rocklahomas and all these great resurgence, you know, mm -hmm. in what I would call straight ahead rock and roll, you know, yes. like the Van Halens and the Rats and the Molly Crews and all that that permeates these walls here. What is it you think about that music, that era that people miss? I think that there was a, um, I mean, part of it is nostalgia, you know, when you connect to songs when you're a young person, yeah. you know, and you have times that you'll never forget Brings and those back. songs are the soundtrack to part of your life so you always have that connection with them but you know for me I'm a music teacher as well I teach during the week and and I hear you know kids bring in a lot of songs that are new stuff and some of it's pretty good but I, I think that the the 
um, the, the clarity and the creativeness of the songs that were written in the 70s and 80s and even into the early 90s, um, the guitar-oriented stuff. You know, the guitar solo went away for a long time and it finally came back. And so now I think actually the rock band video game had a lot to do with that because once that game came out, I would see students come in and they start bringing in you know, Guns N' Roses and Slash and, and you know, even Boston and, yeah. and you know, they start, yeah, Judas Priest, they start, it's like, yeah. where did you find these songs? How do you even know about this? Yeah. You know, and so, so I think that that had something to do with it, but, um, you know, people, uh, I, I think if you're a musician and you're a player, you want stuff that's a little bit challenging to play, and that stuff that came out during those years is uh, interesting and, and it has a lot of texture to it and has a lot of you know, there's a lot of amazing singers, you know, a lot of great lyricists and, and, you know, bands like Rush that were progressive rock, you know, it's very difficult stuff to play. And when you're a young kid and trying to hone your chops and you're looking for stuff that's interesting to play, you'll run into Van Halen and you're going to, you know, if you just want to rock and you want to be heavy, you'll run into Motley Crue. It'll get on your radar, you know, it's just, that's what I've observed happening through being a, a music teacher. Most of my students are guitar students. Okay. So I end up you know, seeing them, you know, they bring in an old Alice Cooper song, and I'm like, where the hell did you find Elected? You know, like, I don't know, I just heard it on Pandora, I just want to play it. And that's terrific, you know, I'm like, well, I already know it, I don't have to learn it, you know, <laughs> to teach it to them, yeah, so, yeah. you know, so it's great. But I think that that's what, what people kind of connect with, people that are our age connect with, you know, they have that period in their lives, but, yeah. you know, and then they listen, they listen to that music themselves, and their kids latch onto it, and then the kids are finding it on Pandora and YouTube because they want to be players, and they want music that has a little more guts to it, you know, so that's what I kind of see happening. Yeah, and, and the music keeps us young, and we want to... And we all want to be young. <laughs> yeah, forever young, you know, it's yeah. uh, the eternal teenager. Today. Yes, guilty, <laughs> but, guilty as charged. But, but, you know, in teaching students and everything, obviously the business has radically changed, where you had record labels that would develop the acts and give you a few albums to find your way and everything. That's completely changed, but you can upload your own music and upload your own videos on it. But what advice do you give to the young players as far as really creating their own style, coming up with their own unique song? Well, you know, I do, part of the, the teaching that I do, I do teach kids how to write songs. I do have songwriting students. I have quite a few of them. And um, I, I teach them how to find their voice and I give them the tools to find their voice. You know, not necessarily, you know, here's how you write a Brian Adams song or here's how you write a Paul McCartney song, you know. It, you know, we, we um, go through different evolutions that give them the tools to discover what gives them satisfaction as a creator, you know, as a person who creates music. And, and what I do encourage them to do, even though the music business has changed drastically, I do have um, students that put, out, that put out records. They play in bands and they put out CDs and they sell 100 copies to their friends. And I have one student that um, did the soundtrack to uh, a play at her school and she you know, we've been writing songs together for three years and she wrote all the songs by herself and, you know, that sort of thing um, gives them the tools to set sail in that arena, you know. Wherever they go is kind of up to them and hopefully they have good people around them and, and don't get involved in, you know, any kind of nefarious activities, but um, they, if they start out with a good set of tools for, with the desire to be creative, then I, I think that they will find their voice as an artist automatically when they get enough experience under their belt. So, but I do, you know, it's drastically different, but I do encourage them to still write their own songs, sell their CDs at a gig or sell their downloads at a gig, you know, put them on a flash drive and sell them for five bucks, you know, do whatever you can mm -hmm. to get your originals in the hands of the people that come to your shows. Even though they're, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16, they, they're, I'm trying to teach them to do what we do on a large scale in yeah. the recording industry. So they get used to that cycle of creating and putting material out there and getting people to listen to them. Yeah, the process is the same. You're just trying to do more and more of it as you get bigger, but it's really one-to-one -one fans and consumers and sure. all of that. Yeah, and they learn the business from, you know, from day one. It's like you got to you know, you got to figure out how to press your CDs or you got to figure out how to make your MP3s and get them on a flash drive and maybe print your name on the flash drives. You know, you got to get somebody to do that. And, 
you know, set up a little web store through big cartel or something, you know, and yeah. keep track of what you're doing, you know. So, um, so yeah, I do have quite a few students that are that are along that path, and they're and they're you know very interested in you know being creative and playing out and writing songs and putting material out there, and you know, and they're writing some catchy songs, and I'm very proud of them, and I'm I'm excited for what their future is, and hopefully. You know, there are lots of other music teachers out there doing the same thing that I'm doing with yeah. kids these days. You know, just paying it forward, man. I mean, that's sure. that's what it's all about. And, you know, hopefully they're learning, you know, since I'm forcing, you know, Van Halen and Led Zeppelin down their throats, so their songs might sound like Van Halen and Led Zeppelin, so, so all is not lost. Not at all. <laughs> now, obviously the business has changed when they start talking about, well, maybe I'm going to get a record deal and all that. What, what do you tell them as far as the dedication of perseverance or... You know, just being a student of the game and really loving it for the love of it as opposed to yes. thinking that somebody's going to hand you a right. bag of cash. Right, right. That's what I tell them. I'm like, don't, it's not like the old days. A record deal is not the most important thing you can do. I tell my students the most important thing you can do is get in a band and play. You know, mm -hmm. nobody cares about a video. If people come to your shows and you suck, they're not going to come back. Yeah. So I make sure to tell them that the most important thing, if you got to get in more than one band, get in more than one band. I've always been in a couple bands, and you know, most guys that you read about were always, you know, a guy like Dave Grohl's in ten bands before yeah. at the same time. You, you know, something from every one of them. Exactly. So you know, if you surround yourself with as many, you know, musicians as you can, and take advantage of those opportunities when they came up, when they come up, most of the time it's like you're creating your own opportunities by being in several different bands and being in the scene and playing a lot. And, you know, there's no substitute for experience. And that's what I try to drive home to, to them is like, just get out and play. Oh, it's a, you know, I only get to play four songs. It doesn't matter. You get to play four songs, which is not in your basement, you know. So, so they're getting it. You know, they, they appreciate the, the opportunities there. Um, so, um, so I think that that's, uh, that's the right way to go about it these days is to, you know, get out there, hone your chops and, you know, same thing that applied to us. I mean, we played gigs seven nights a week playing covers, you know, playing, sure. you know, Michael Jackson songs. And, yeah, and, yeah exactly. Yeah. And you get good when you play that a, a lot. And so, you know, they're starting to understand that. And it's sinking in and, and you know, they'll take gigs that, that don't pay well, that don't pay at all, yeah. but they get to play. And they get to get their musical feelers out there, get used to being on stage, get used to things going badly for them. And having some rough gigs, you know, you got to get some tough gigs under your belt and, and, you know, have that horrible feeling of, oh, why did I ever leave my house before you can appreciate the really good gigs, you know. So, um, so that's what I try to, try to drive home with them, you know, they're, they're, and they're getting it. I think they're doing well.